So, I'm not going to read this whole thing, uh, but I, I thought you'd be, I thought you'd find it interesting. <laughs> you to print that out. I know. I need to get a new copy. That's pretty shattered. Okay. So. Um, I'll buy you some paper. Thank you, brother. I get to. Uh, one of the things uh, people ask me all the time: Did you know? Did writing the shack change your life? And I. And I tell them, honestly, not in any way that matters in terms of who I am, which is kind of a miraculous thing to begin with. Everything that mattered to me was in place before I wrote it. And that stuff hasn't changed. Now, it's not that there hasn't been some incredible parts of this. Like, people write me their stuff, or they send me letters and notes and cards and stories, and I get to be inside people's stories. And these, in in a singular kind of way, in some senses, they're, you know, to be inside a person's story is to be in, on holy ground. It really is. And, and uh, because you're dealing with a human being. And that story is woven inside the affection of the Father, Son, Holy Spirit. And as someone tells, we have an affinity for story because we each are one, right? And um, so I get to be a part of some very amazing stories. And over the next couple days, what we have left, I'll probably tell you some of them because you wouldn't believe them unless I was here telling you this, that these things actually are part of how God is involved in the details. Now. People have also written things on the internet and responded to the book in different ways, you know. <laughs> and uh, I don't know if you, there's been a controversy about the book. I don't know if you knew that. <laughs> Some people, when Papa came through the door, they sh that was it. Like my mom. And um, true story. She, she tried to read it because I'm her son. <laughs> And when Papa came through the door, and if you haven't read the book, Papa is a large black African-American woman. That's God the Father and, uh, named Papa. And I mixed the metaphors. And when, when Papa came through the door, she closed the book and picked up the phone, called my sister and said, Debbie, your brother is a heretic. <laughs> that was my mom, right? And at some point, I'll tell you how she got past that. But it took a miracle. <laughs> So people make comments on, on, on uh, internet and stuff like this. And I thought this one, this one is classic on so many different levels. And, um, and I thought you would appreciate it in light of some of the conversation that we've been having. And so it starts this way. I'm not going to read the whole thing by any means, but you'll get the idea. And so there was a, a website that posted a very positive review on the shack. And, um, and people then responded to it. You know, you have your comments, and then people can respond to those comments. So, you know, it kind of becomes this little community of response. Well, one of the comments comes from somebody whose pen name, at least, is Aram, A-R-A-M, which could be Mara backwards. So it could be male, or it could be female. I don't know. And you can't really tell by how it's written. But this is what this person's response to that review was. And then I'm going to read you a response to their response, which both are classic. My name is Aram, and I just finished reading The Shack, and then I went online and happened across a bunch of people arguing about it for what looks like a few years now. <laughs> they're, call they're calling it heresy, a dangerous book, and warning people not to read it. Why? I normally never comment on these things, but being an unbeliever, yes, that's right, I'm not a Christian, I thought it might be useful for some of the theology-spouting people to take a moment and look at what I, not a churchgoer in any way, have gleaned from this little book. And then ask yourself, because I really don't know much about the Bible, is anything I learned leading me in the wrong direction? Perhaps all the way to the burning lake of fire? so many Christians try loving to scare non-Christians into believing by. If that's the case, then I guess you're right. Based on what you believe, people shouldn't read this book. For me, 
I don't believe fear and rules are the answer, and I never have. This has been the main reason for my avoidance of the church. However, when you preach love and forgiveness through whatever means conveys it the best, whether fiction or otherwise, well, my heart op begins to open a tad. It makes me actually want to pick up a Bible, perhaps, and maybe read a little further. Teach love, my Christian friends, because people like me, we don't respond well to fear tactics. And we definitely don't get turned on by arrogant church leaders who think they've got it all figured out. So below I've listed 57 new ideas I took away from this little book. 57. I'll read you the first dozen so you get a feel for this. Number one, the different appearances of God, Jesus, and the Holy Spirit were used to help Mac break his religious conditioning. Not bad for number one. <laughs> number two, you don't get brownie points for doing things through obligation. Number three, life takes a lot of time and a lot of relationship. Now listen to this one. Number four, how free are we really with family genetics, social influences, personal habits, advertising, propaganda, and paradigms? Period. Freedom is an incremental process that happens inside a relationship with Jesus Christ. <laughs> Not bad for an unbeliever. <laughs> yeah. Number five, when all you can see is your pain, perhaps you're losing sight of God. Number six, Pain has a way of clipping our wings so that we can't fly. After a while, we forget we were ever created to fly. Number seven. When Jesus became a man, he gave up his own ability to heal people and do miracles. His miracles were accomplished by Jesus's, a man-dependent, limited human being's trust in the Father God. We're all designed to live like that, out of God's life and power. Number eight, God exists in three persons, so we, his creation, can also live in love and relationship just like God does. If God didn't, we couldn't. God cannot act apart from love. Number nine, relationships are never supposed to be about power, and one way to avoid wanting power is to limit yourself and serve. Ten, Sin is its own punishment, devouring from the inside. It's not God's purpose to punish it, it's His joy to cure it. And I would add one caveat to that. It's His intention to destroy it. Eleven, when people choose independence over relationship, we become a danger to each other. Number twelve, when Christians don't trust God, it's because they don't know they're loved by Him. They think God is not good. Okay, there's 57 of those. Do you get the idea here? All right, now, after, I mean, you could pick a number and I could, t I could read it, and it's just like those. 22. 22, <laughs> 22 actually comes from 21. There's, they're related to each other. 21. God is light and God is good. Removing ourselves from God will plunge us into darkness. Declaring independence will result in evil because apart from God you can only draw on yourself. That is death because you have separated yourself in your mind from God who is life. 22. This concept is difficult for us because the good may be the presence of the damaging things in our lives. So do you answers, don't you think we care about the people who are suffering too? Each of them is now the center of another story that is untold. That's 22. 35. 35. <laughs> got it? I got it. 35. Learn to live loved. Thirty-seven. Thirty-seven. 
who's, who's listening to God here? 37. Jesus will travel any road to find His. 43. Our transformation is a miracle greater than raising the dead. 44. All evil flows from independence. 45. God's purposes are always and only an expression of love. God works life out of death, freedom out of brokenness, and light out of darkness. Last one. As soon as I can find it, I think I might have dumped it on the floor. Okay, I think this is it. I told you, this thing's kind of got worn out. Okay, I'll read you the last three or so. Oh, I'll start with 54. I'll start with 52. <laughs> 51. <laughs> 50. I'll start with 50. I, I keep looking at these things going, oh my gosh, right? 50. To the degree we live with expectations and responsibilities is the degree we fear and the degree we don't trust or know God. Oh my gosh. I mean, we could camp there for a good long time. Well, let me read it again. To the degree that we live with expectations and responsibilities. Let me tell you, the word responsibility is not in the Bible. And let me tell you further that it arose out of the, um, the Industrial Revolution. And it was a twisting of a word that is in Scripture, which is response. And dunamis is having an ability to respond. That's present tense. The Holy Spirit dwells within you to give you an ability to respond. As soon as you take that and turn it into a matrix of responsibility, you've killed something. Right? And this person picked that up. 51. If God is the center of everything, then together we can live through everything that happens to us. 52. Forgiveness is big. 53. When bad things happen, what God has to offer us in response is His love, His goodness, and relationship. 54. God doesn't do humiliation, condemnation, or shame. They don't produce one speck of wholeness or righteousness. 55. Forgiving isn't about forgetting. It's about letting go of another person's throat. 56. Forgiveness does not create a relationship. It simply removes them from your judgment. 57. Because you are important to God, everything is important. Okay? So this is the response. Hey, Aram. Only an unbeliever could have your clarity and insight. <laughs> Believers' minds tend to be clouded and controlled by their beliefs. Believers can't think clearly. Every bit of information is evaluated not for its truth, wisdom, or usefulness, but whether or not it's consistent with what is already believed. You appear to have derived so much more from the shack than a lot of believers will be able to. They'll reject the insight simply because it differs from their paradigm. And they'll miss the benefits that you've gained from the book. Well done. Don't ever let believers interfere with whatever your walk with God turns out to be. I didn't. No. I did not write that. I didn't write either one of them, right? No. The second one was not me. It was somebody's response to his, whoever this, this is on the website. It was the next, it was the first response after what they had written. I, I photocopied it right off the website. It was a, the website that did the original review. Um, if you uh, want to find these, um, if you go to W.M. Paul Young, William Paul Young, but just W.M. is the short form for William, and uh, WMPaulYoung.com, you go to, um, in the blog area, there's an archive, and it's in the archives, right? And, um, yeah, PaulYoung.com, right? And that'll link you to Twitter and that whole universe of Facebook and stuff. And um, um, I don't know if any of you... Follow me on Facebook, but for the last 
number of months I've been doing this thing called words that you'll never hear God say. It's, they're awesome because you never think in terms of what God won't say. You always think of you know, what he's telling you to do, right? And when you flip it on its head, they become stunning. Like words you'll never hear God say, I'm sorry you died, there's nothing I can do for you now. You know? Uh, and there, it's just like, wow, this really it sort of twists the perspective a bit, you know? So anyway, that's just the Facebook stuff. But um, I thought that you'd find that interesting. Baxter is going to unwind some things in terms of how this works inside our own soul, what we're talking about. So we don't want this to just be theoretical. And uh, like Joyce said, I had a great conversation today that I hope will spill over into some of our conversation. And I've had another conversation with Yulin. And, and uh, these conversations are just living. You, you understand that when Baxter and I are in the middle of these conversations, it's always two-way. We are hearing things, and even when we get to say things, a lot of times we're saying them in a way that's really helpful to us, or we're listening to what you're saying, and that's really helpful to us. Right? We don't have this mentality of being superior to anybody. Mm. We know where we come from. We're married. We're married. <laughs> and not to each other. <laughs> <laughs> oh, Paul. What does the C stand for? Cool. <laughs> Stands for Charles. Charles. Yeah. Charles. Charles. Yeah. I, I thought, no, <laughs> <laughs> I want to write uh, this uh, statement from Irenaeus or a condensed version of it as a way of orienting us, and then I want to go into what I call. Um, I don't know how it got to be called this, but it's, it's become called the soul diagram, so you may understand it a little bit. But first, I want um, Irenaeus says that, that our Lord Jesus became. Uh, it's in there, look it up. Uh, <laughs> it's in that 38 volume church history. <laughs> I R E N A E U S. Someone said that they were having difficulty in understanding me, so I thought I would write it down. <laughs> no, I'm just, I um, I mumble a lot. Plus, th there's a little slight accent different. Um, <laughs> My, uh, my youngest daughter, Catherine, and I were going to Australia when she was about 13, 12 years old. And I was explaining to her, I said, Catherine, you know, we're going to a foreign country. And she said, I know, Dad. And I said, when she said, but what do you mean? I said, well, the food's going to be different and, uh, and the people talk with different accents. And she said, well, what's an accent, Dad? And I said, well, you know, Mr. Bruce, he comes over and sees us. You know how he talks different than we do? And she said, she said, I don't think I have an accent, Daddy. <laughs> That's the whole deal. You cannot hear your own accent. You cannot see your own sin, your own darkness. Anyway, just that was free. Jesus became, Jesus became what we are to bring us to be what he is in himself. Now part of this discussion about the, the three chairs, the Father, Son, and Spirit, and the G.O.D. thing is to, uh, part of that... Is that wart or is that <laughs> What? <laughs> well, I, I write in tongues too, so... <laughs> True story. I got to do my Paul Young thing then. You don't want to see me do my <laughs> Paul and I uh, ended up being 
at a conference together in Toronto, so 2007 or 8 or something like that. I don't remember. We didn't know we were going to be there. And so we ended up having an afternoon together. And I was just coming back from a couple of places where they had invited me to teach on the theology of the shack. So I had this one page thing that I just had scribbled this way, down, that way, upside down, on different colors and all. It just was a mess, you know. And so I, I ran into Paul and I said, hey, Paul, I said, do you want to see the theology of the shack? You know, <laughs> I held it to him. I said, I said, see that? And I thought he would go, what? And he goes, yeah, 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 yeah. <laughs> That's when the plot was hatched, right there, to, um, to do the shack revisited. Okay, this is Irenaeus, as I said before, is a disciple of Polycarp, who at least knew John, if not was a lot closer relation. So we're going way back, and I wanted to write this down. Jesus became what we are to bring us to be what he is in himself. There is implicit in this statement an entire theological vision. And part of the part, and there is implicit in God an entire theological vision. So, and you could uh, take Second Corinthians eight nine. He became he who was rich became poor to bring us to, uh, to that he might make, uh, bring us to be rich. Uh, we through his poverty might be might become rich. Second Corinthians eight nine. Same sort of thing. This runs in the early church all the way through history. It's picked up by John Calvin. It's picked up by Luther. And again and again it gets lost as if this is just sort of a, a sub-point. Well, just think this out for one second with, or a few minutes with me. The goal of the incarnation, the goal of the incarnation, of the becoming of Jesus, uh, becoming of human, is that he can bring us to be what he is in himself. Now, you know, we're back here. When Who is Jesus? He's, so... What do you see in this statement about what has to happen? If the dream of the Father, Son, and Spirit is that we would be brought to be what Jesus is in himself, what is necessary that has to happen here? Pardon? He, he has to bring us. Well, how is he going to get to us? So he has to become uh, human. And this is the, so he's going to become what we are and what we are as human. And then we look back here. So there's some things that are being said to us that are implicit about who is Jesus. So he's going to bring us to be who he is in himself. He is the Father's Son. He is the Anointed One. What else? He's the Creator and the Lord of all creation. He's the living expression, the invisible image, I mean the expression of the Father himself. So if he is going to, if he's going to bring us to be this, and this is not a static thing, it's not a positional thing, it's not a place. This booming a little bit? It's not a place. The, the dream of the Father, Son, and Spirit is that all, this way, Okay. The dream of the Father, Son, and Spirit is not simply that we would all go to a place called heaven when we die. It is that we would be included in this relationship. And that everything that Jesus himself knows, when he hears his Father say, You, you are my beloved in whom my soul delights. And everything that the Father knows when he hears Jesus say, in the freedom and the joy of the Holy Spirit, Abba, Father, whatever, however you describe the life that passes in that, that's what they're after. They want us to be brought into this life with them. Not simply, like I said, going to a place called heaven when we die, but to be included in this relationship such that it becomes as much ours by experience as it is theirs. You see that? That's rather astounding, is it not? I mean, how... Paul and I sometimes look around the room and think, how did we get in the middle of this? 
But that's really the cry of all. How in the world do we, what, what kind of goodness here? So Athanasius, who follows Irenaeus, he's, he's got a statement that I love. He, he wrote this when he was 21 years old. He said, the God of all is good and supremely noble by nature. Therefore, he is, what do you think he says after that? The God of all is good and supremely noble by nature. Therefore, he is the lover of the human race. Now, no one can explain. It's, it's the, the, the root of this love for us flows right here in the way the Father, Son, and Spirit love one another. But we, we stand mystified as to why this relationship, why the Father, Son, and Spirit have dreamed of including the likes of us. And not, like I said, on the back porch in, of a place called heaven, but actually in the middle of this relationship. So that it is, it is pouring out of you and me in our relationships with one another and in our relationship with all creation as much as it is the Father, Son, and Spirit. In fact, I don't know exactly what all Jesus means when he says this, but he says greater works will we do because he goes to the Father. So... This is the dream, is to bring us to be here. That necessitates, that carries with it a certain rhythm, a certain logic, a certain something's got to happen. That this, in order for this to come to, to pass, uh, for Jesus to bring us to be what he is himself, he has to become what we are. And that's what Irenaeus is saying. And we're human. But we're not just human, we're also flesh. So that's why John, in his gospel, doesn't use the word human Anthropos in the Greek, he uses sarx, which is flesh. Because John knows that we're going to miss the point if we're not careful. That we're going to see that Jesus became human, but he doesn't really, um, as I think I said this, I can't remember if we were in here in another conversation, but it would be like the, the Max Yacht uh, catamaran out there in the bay. Jesus became human, he's among us, but we have no way to get from flesh to there. Human is not flesh, they're not the same thing. Human is, is who we are, it's our nature, and then flesh has to do with our fallenness. So it's almost like if he doesn't come all the way to our flesh, then he's leaving us out. He's just become human. That's almost like you would say he, he went and joined Adam before the fall in the Garden of Eden. And that may be nice before Adam, before the fall, but he never exists anymore before the fall, and neither do we. So you see there's this necessity to push this a little bit further. And then there's a third thing, and that is flesh. I mean, uh, uh, sin. And this is the big one that nobody knows how even to dare to talk about. And without the boldness of the Apostle Paul, no one would ever have said this. But he, Jesus, became what we are. He became human. He became flesh. He became sin. And this, to me, is the most beautiful news in the universe. And he's going to take this, and he's going to take it here. I, my default setting is to present to Jesus um, a Sunday version of myself. Now, I don't know if you have this sort of thing uh, in your country, but in our country, especially in the Bible Belt, we dress up on Sunday morning, and we go to church, and we grin, and, every, and everything's fine, and how's your mom and them? Come by and see us, and let's have, you know, everything's fine. Now, you fight like cats and dogs to get ready on time, and you fight, you know, like mad when you get there, but when you get out of the car, how you doing? Good to see you, fine. And, and we present this. You know, and, and we do. And that's part of what Paul was talking about, this thin layer, this facade. But we do. I mean, we represent this. Like my dad, you know, he stepped across the threshold and he's in his, he's in his I'm worshiping God mode, which is wholly distinct from his ordinary mode. And so part of the beauty of this is that what Jesus has come to lay hold of is not just me and my humanity and not just me even in my flesh. He's come to find it all. And when you begin to see that Jesus has hold of you as a sinner, whatever that may mean to you, or all of your broken bits, all the things that you're ashamed, when you see that he has that, and he has taken that with him into this relationship, and they are bearing 
our darkness. The Father, Son, and Spirit are bearing our darkness. They're coping with it, uh, and they are undoing it right there in this relationship. Then you can begin to understand that, that what is happening in the biblical story is far larger than simply the Father, Son, and Spirit's thinking, okay, we have to find a way, now that Adam has sinned and transgressed the law, we now have to find a way that we can make them righteous. We can declare them clean, not guilty. Um, yes? That's what I'm going to talk about right now. You're right on cue. Are we talking about original sin? Yes. The original sin? Um, no, not particularly. I hadn't, talk, I hadn't used that language. Yeah. That's a whole other question uh, as to how... Um, the, the basic point is I, I just want you to see the general thing. I'm not defining this yet. I, I don't... Because um, that's, that, that's important. And maybe we can deal with that... Um, in some Q&A or whatever, but, but I want to move this in another direction so you can see uh, a little bit more about why this discussion is so important and about what's going on in our inner worlds. But for me, the, the, this is so beautiful because this gives me a place to rest, especially when I'm feeling guilt and when I'm being accused. And when things are terrible are going, I, I'm losing control and the facade's coming down. What you discover, this is what you discover, is that this, all these dimensions of us are in Jesus. And so, I'm going to erase this, so it's too late. It's gone forever now. <laughs> Although somebody has a diagram on their website of all of this. So, how many of you have ever heard the whisper, I am not? Anybody? Anybody ever not heard it? I am not. See, I, w I was wrestling with all this, trying to understand certain dimensions of it in terms of the brokenness of our soul. And I was reading in John's Gospel when Peter betrayed Jesus. And it's uh, the slave girl uh, said to him, it says, the, the slave girl, therefore, who kept the door said to Peter, you are not also one of this man's disciples, are you? And he said, I am not. End of sentence. And when he said, when I read that, I thought, oh man, I am not smart. I am not. Pardon? Sin? Then, I am not useful, pretty. I think you guys have heard these things. Not, what was the other one? Worthy. Lovable. That's one of mine. Adequate. Somebody else said something I didn't get. What was the other one that came up from over here? Fast. Fast. Okay. Ooh. I'm not enough. How about this one? Saved. What else? Whole? Holy. Holy. Whole or whole. Alone. Not alone? Yeah. Not special? All right, y'all got to repeat those. I've got southern ears. I'm... What was it? Not convincing. That's good. Not needed. Woo. Not visible. I 
wrote visible because of Debbie. And I, and I was trying, and I couldn't hear. So. <laughs> Confident. I'm not wanted. Ooh. Do we have important on there? Valuable, understood. Okay, man, we're getting a good list going here. Intelligent. What'd you say, Mark? Ever gone over concept. I'm not ever gone over concept. So give me an acronym on that one or something. No. An overcomer. Overcomer. Okay. Not godly. Not godly. Okay, this we can go and I, I would encourage you to um, this is very important. This, this is where we get locked. So if you take some time tonight or tomorrow, you can ask the Lord about this if you don't have a pretty good handle already on, on what you're... I've got a whole family of them, not just one. <laughs> um, one of my big ones is not there yet. And if you're not there yet, you're always trying to get there. And one of the great fruits of trying to get there is you're not there which means you're not there for your children, you're not there for your spouse, you're not there for your friends because you're trying to get there. And even when you are here, you're not here because you're trying to get there. And you can spend your whole life trying to get there and never be able to be here. See what I'm saying? <laughs> that sounded like Paul Young, didn't <laughs> You know? Um, so... This, these things come to us not by simply um, a whisper. They're usually anchored in events in our lives. I told you the story about my grandmother. You know, bless his heart, he's just dumb. Um, and so there's someone in our lives beside the Father, Son, and Spirit who is sitting around the edges waiting for something to happen waiting for some trauma or some failure or some hurt to happen. And he seizes upon this and whispers his interpretation. It's not even our interpretation. We're not even, we're talking early on. I sometimes think about you know, what would happen in a child that's say a year old, year and a half, still in the, in the baby bed, and mom and dad are really, really having a hard go 24-7. And so the child feels this, 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 this uh, discord, this conflict, this pain in the room. You know, you can feel it when you walk in a room to somebody's house and they're ha actually having an argument, but then they do the, hey, come on in. You know, it's like you can cut this stuff. So a child is a year and a half sitting and crying. It doesn't have the, the theological or the intellectual capacity to say, uh, Oh, mom's drunk again. Oh, dad's having a bad hair day. You know, it can, all it can do is feel this. And, it, and, and it's not internalizing it. It's already there inside its own soul. It's feeling this discord and this pain. And so there is one, and this is how insidious evil is. He's waiting for that. He's waiting for that because he's going to whisper in interpretation. And what we do is we, we take that interpretation and we bring it into here, which is the soul or the inner world or the shack or as my friend Julian says, the inside on the inside. And so this is going to come to us and we're open to it and it comes here. Now these, are, like I said, these are not things that we intellectualize. They are things that um, are whispered to us in the context of pain. Um, let me give you a couple of stories. And this, these stories can go to profound trauma. Uh, one lady stood up in one of the meetings I was doing where I was talking about this, and she said that when she was little, 
that she was sexually abused within her own family and she said and repeatedly and she said my mother knew it she knew it and she said the pain of being abused was terrible enough but what was the worst was that my mother did nothing so you can see how I am not worthy is not a theoretical idea that this this young woman is carrying around in her soul this is profound stuff and it shatters the insides which is going to have effect upon what we can perceive or not perceive uh, in our adult relationships and in our lives. I have a friend out west in the United States that told me the story about when he was five years old, his dad, this is way back, he's an older man now, and he said his, my dad was plowing in the field behind a mule. So that's, that's how long it was. And, and he told me this story not long ago. And he said that uh, he heard his dad whistle and he did this signal, which meant to his mom to send out tape because he was getting blisters. His gloves, I guess, had worn through. Or maybe they didn't have enough money to even buy gloves. But, so my friend was five or six years old. And he said, so I thought, I, I can do this. So he got the roll of tape and he went running out to his dad and he went under the fence and he went running and he tore off a piece and said it was about seven inches long and he said by the time I got to dad it was all stuck on all twisted and gnarled it's just like a wad and he said my dad he said I, I can never forget this Baxter he said my dad snatched it from my hand and he looked at me with this just undiluted disgust and he put his hand on my head and he spun me around and he kicked me in the ass and knocked me on the ground. And he said, and I peed in my pants and I got up and I cried all the way home. So 70 years later, the dude's still shaking when he's telling me this. Now he didn't, he didn't get this idea that I'm not good enough or I'm not special from just some whisper, random, or from something, this is trauma. And you got someone in our lives or not in our lives, on the periphery of our lives, the kudzu king that is just waiting for that to happen because he's going to interpret it. And then every time anything happens to you along those lines, he's going to be there again to confirm it and confirm it and confirm it and confirm it. And what happens is we take this inside of our souls, we make agreements. I like the word agreements a little bit. It's by faith as well. Or belief we take this inside agreements a little bit different for me these days than the word faith because agreement what does that mean what what's it, it means it starts somewhere else doesn't it you know it's 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 some it, we are agreeing to this interpretation that in our head sounds like our own interpretation because it usually sounds like our own voice or maybe the voice of our parents. Um, I have another friend that told me the story when he was little. He was six years old. His, his uncle gave him a dog, a, a border collie, and the border collie's name was Rose. This story is in the back of uh, Across All Worlds, my book Across All Worlds. In the book, the dog is named Charlie, but the truth is Rose. And um, he said he and Rose were like best friends. And he said every single night, Rose would go to sleep beside me. And he said, Baxter, I can remember going to sleep, rubbing Rose's head. And I'd go to sleep, wake up in the morning, and she was there ready to go. He said she went swimming in the creek. She, she raced behind me on my bike. She went hunting with us. Everything I did except Sunday church and school, Rose was there. And we, even then, she was waiting for me when I got back. And he said that somewhere around his 12th birthday, Rose died. And he, he didn't tell me what happened. I'm sitting in a truck with a grown man. And tears are coming down. And he said, Rose died. And he said, uh, I didn't ask him how. And he said, so I stood on the back porch and I picked up Rose and I went back into the backyard and I dug a hole and there was an old boat paddle that was split and there was an old tire swing with some rope and I took that rope and that boat paddle and I made a little cross and I buried Rose and I came back and he said, I stood on my back porch crying my eyes out at 12 years old. He said, my mom and dad 
and brothers, sisters, I'm not sure who all was in the house, maybe some some family, other family members. And he said, I stood there crying my eyes out and not a single person came out to comfort me at all. And uh, not one. And which doesn't necessarily mean anything in itself because the family may have been cooking supper or something and busy, you know, and not noticing that particular. But you see, it's the build up. It's the little whispers all along the way. So there my friend is at 12 years old standing alone in the cosmos. His best friend, the most reliable friend he'd ever had is gone. Nobody's there to even tell him, hey, there are horses in heaven in the book of Revelation. Maybe you and Rose can be back together again. You know, no one's even there to say, look, I know this is devastating, but we're going to get you another dog or walk back there and cry with him. So he looks at me sitting in this truck, this grown man, tears coming down his face. He said, Baxter, I learned that day that I do not matter. I am not important. Now, that is an agreement that he made. And is it difficult to forecast his future? What happens if he becomes, let's say, a successful lawyer because by God he will prove he is important and he's leaving a trail of wreckage behind him and someone tells him you did a great job and he looks down because he can't believe he did a good job because he believes he's not important. I think today Bruce and I were talking and he was talking about these, what, what I'm calling the I am nots really become the Lord of your life. They really do. They drive you. They control you. They shape you. They move you. Most of us are unaware that this is even going on. And uh, at least it seems that way to me. Um, there are plenty more others. There are plenty of other stories, but those two are enough. Those three stories are enough to help you see that uh, there is one who is standing on the periphery of your life, and he does not want you to know who you are. And he is going to find a way, just like this, to whisper and then to confirm. And then the minute something happens, you take my friend and his dog, it's not surprising that he has a hard time accepting his wife's love. He can't even really believe that she loves him because he's not important. It can't be real. So now his I am not has become a pair of glasses. And it's shaping the way he sees and doesn't see what is really going on around him and the way he relates and doesn't relate to his wife and then to his children and then to all the people around him. Now, you put a bunch of folks in a room like that, you know, you got a ticking time bomb. And how in the world is she going to endure? Because she is trying to love a man who cannot receive his love or love. Sooner or later, she is going to be worn down. You were saying this one that's on the outside of our lives, anywhere in Israel, where the devil, don't you? Right. Yeah. Sort of... Here's it, here, the name, the Greek word for uh, for uh, serpent is Ophis. O P H I S. <laughs> I love that. <laughs> it's Ophis. You know, it's not. He's not worthy of a dignified name. <laughs> he's a coward. He hurts children. His name is Ophis. And we stand in Jesus Christ above him. He will not come out and even show a two-year-old what he's doing. Because his breath smells like gargoyle. And we would know him. So he hides. Hides in the shadow and he whispers. And he discombobulates our insides and we don't even know it's happened. And then he's so... I'll give him credit on this. He's good enough that he gets us to make these agreements... And then he hides the fact that we've done so. It took a lot of work for my, my friend to get to the place to where he could remember what happened with Rose. And he could even talk about it because he didn't remember it. It's like it suddenly just goes over here. Now, let me give you another illustration. Not so much a story, but this is something in my own journey. The Lord has um, showed me one time recently um, a beaver dam. A beaver dam. You know what a beaver dam is? You have those down here? No. 
<laughs> What's funny about that? I, I did a I did a I did a whole lecture in Scotland one time on um, how Jesus is not a divine crescent wrench. Exactly. I get to the end, hand goes up. What's a crescent wrench? <laughs> and I told him, and he says, "Oh, you mean a spanner?" I said, "Well, somebody could have told me that." So. At least, thank you. Do you do you know what I'm talking about by Beaver Dam? You've seen one, with all the all the layers and stuff. Well, the Lord showed me a picture of a Beaver Dam inside of my own soul, and I could see the water trickling through. But He said, Baxter, that Beaver Dam is holding back the river of living water. And I said, Lord, what what is this? What is this Beaver? And he said, this this Beaver Dam is really these agreements that you have made in your life, each time you make one of these things, a little tree goes in there, a little tree goes in there, and the mud, and the leaves, and the tricks, and the twigs, and all this. And that thing, if you've ever, well, it's extremely difficult in real life to get rid of a beaver dam. The only way to do it, really, is to blow it up with a dynamite. <laughs> and you can get in there and pull these things out, but this takes a long time. The other way is to go in at the bottom and pull the bottom one out. And then it begins to flow. But, and then the Lord showed me that this beaver dam was not simply one that was inside of me, but it, I saw another one that was, that was huge. It was so big, I, it scared me. And I said, Lord, what on earth? What is this? Because it was so, you know the Mississippi River? You know? It's our biggest river. It's, really, it's a mile and a half wide. It was so big, this beaver dam, it could stop the Mississippi River. And I said, Lord, what, what are you trying to show me? What is this? And he said, this beaver dam is, the, is, the, is made up of the agreements that theologians and pastors and Christians have made with darkness about me, about my Father, about the Holy Spirit, about the human race. And he said, and the big, because this, this beaver dam across the Mississippi was the, the, the logs at the bottom of this thing were sequoias, redwoods. You know what I'm talking about, redwood? <laughs> They're bigger than that, that door, that whole opening. I was just out there uh, last year, Paul and I were near there, and that, that's the big ones down at the bottom. And the one right at the very bottom that's blocking up the entire Western family conversation and keeping the river from flowing is the lie, the central lie of separation. It is, I am not included. So, but right now I'm talking about individual and um, not the big picture thing for the moment. And, and how these these agreements go inside of our soul and when they're here they produce a fruit so what is a fruit what what happens inside your inner world when you believe that you're not pretty or you're not useful or worthy or lovable or good enough or saved or this one's safe or important it produces a fruit what is that fruit does it produce hope fear, fear. What else? Ooh, shame. Discouragement. Despair. Um, how about anger? What? Pardon? Inaction. How about anxiety and angst? Ooh. Depression. Paralysis. Paralysis. Guilt. You know, it gets sort of gnarly pretty quick, doesn't it? This is why reading the Bible more and praying harder <laughs> doesn't work. We try it. But it just doesn't have the capacity to go inside here and begin to undo this. But it's so profound, every one of us is, is in the hunt to find a real solution. And this is going to lead us into uh, a whole lot of um, 
we're going to cope with this one way or another. Uh, people like me and Paul, we cope with this by becoming more religious. You know, I'm not worthy, but I can become worthy if I get to do this or become that. So that's, that's really self-salvation. That's number one. Uh, I am not special, but I can be special if I can get married to this person, or I can get that job, or I can get this amount of money, or I can get this, this place, or I can become included in this group. And these things are driving you know, not only driving us as individuals, but us as nations, and I think the entire international geopolitical thing is flowing right out of these I am nots. And so we, we try to save ourselves. I'm not special, but I can become special if I can get a PhD at the University of Aberdeen. That will be my solution. Then I will be there. Um, and then we have at least four other coping strategies or mechanisms that we use to try to deal with this. And for me, this is all unconscious, it's invisible, I didn't know about it, and it's automatic. <laughs> it's just like he's got us, and he just comes along, and that little whisper, and it just punches a button, and off it goes. And we don't even know it. These things, this, this world here is what I call um, the lethal rue. Or the toxic, the river of toxic waste. Uh, you know what a roux is? Roux is a, is a French cooking term. And it was taken up by people in my part of the world, the Cajuns, and elevated to an art form. Uh, a roux is you put uh, butter or oil um, and flour and you just keep over medium heat and you keep moving and, and uh, stirring it and you get it can be a blonde roux or a light brown roux or brown roux or dark you know and so it becomes the base and then you put if you're cooking um, most Cajun dishes once you make your roux you put in and this is what they call it the holy trinity of Cajun cooking it is it's onions bell pepper and celery chopped finely and you put that in there and then once that sort of you're starting to get hungry again, <laughs> then you ladle in a little uh, seafood stock or crawfish stock, and that becomes your root, your base. And whatever you put in that pot is going to be permeated by the flavors of that root. So this is what this world here that we may not even know about is in the actual fact a, a, a root of death. It's lethal and it is flowing into our relationships, it's flowing into our music, it's flowing into our uh, lives, our work, our play. This is why uh, you know men that play golf every Saturday with their mates and yet they've never one time ever been free to play. It's just like they just hit and move on, hit and move on, hit and move on and they get done with that and they go do something else. It's uh, flowing out of this. this um, it's also why you can hear um, an exegetically perfect sermon that is delivered with great rhetorical skill and accuracy and grammar and diction and yet it be dead as hell. I learned this, uh, I learned something about this early on in my marriage when it's on a Saturday afternoon, um, late Saturday morning I got up and uh, I told my wife Beth, I said I'm going to play golf with my friend David and and I got my clubs headed out the door and she said, well, what about our, our date? And I'm like, what do you mean? She said, well, we were going to go do such and such and such and such at 2 o'clock. And she said, oh, don't worry about going and play golf. And I said, okay. So I get in the car. And <laughs> so I get, I get toward the golf course and I think, you know, this is not smart. <laughs> Kid you not. And so I turned around and came home. I came home and I said, uh, brought my clubs in. I said, Beth, I said, listen, um, I'm not going to play golf today. I love you and I want to spend the afternoon with you. And she looked at me and just burst out laughing. <laughs> and that's when I learned that communication involves far more than words and actions.
soul. Because I said the right thing and I did the right thing. But she's reading this and out of my innermost being was flowing something that didn't fit with my words and didn't even fit with my actions. Um, we in the West want to hide behind our words. I said this. And like Paul does, he'll give you a sentence. I don't, did, he, did you do that the other night? I think so. Something about, he said he didn't steal the... Did he, so you can hide, well, just look at what it says, you know. But there's so much more going on. So this, this invisible world flows right into this, and this is what's fueling our religion. Now, let me show you how that works, and then I can... Uh, because what we do is we take this lethal rue, the fear and shame and guilt and despair and anger and inaction and anxiety and ang angst and hopelessness and depression and this other word, dread. Um, these, are, these are gnarly things, aren't they? Not real fun. We take these and without knowing what we're doing, they become our pair of glasses through which we see ourselves and life and more important through which we construct G-O-D the origin of this dude is not in the character and nature of God it's in the whisper of evil and our agreement with it you see that? The origin of G-O-D, the faceless, nameless, omni-being, is not in the nature and character of God. It is in our I am nots, ultimately whispered to us by evil, which we have agreed to, which has created this pain, and we're projecting that. So we're going to create a God in the image of our own hurt. We're going to tar Papa's face with the brush of our own angst, our own anxiety. And this God is going to be distant, fearful, impersonal. What else? Shallow, Shallow yes. Insecure. Insecure. Whoa. Oh, demanding, judgmental. Who demanding, judgmental, um, unavailable. Passionless. Dismissive. Passionless. I never can spell that. We'll just put N A R on there. <laughs> the reason my mother says the reason you write so poorly is because you can't spell <laughs> I, I told her I said I've signed probably about 2,000 books and I haven't misspelled my name one time <laughs> and she said well how would anybody know <laughs> this is part of my journey I did not learn this in a um, psychology book. I learned this because in my journey I kept getting my backside handed to me by something invisible and I could not figure out what it was. And I have been kicking against all of this my entire life trying to sort it through and understand it because I'm not the only one who gets their backside handed to them on a regular basis without understanding what it is. And the heart of our depression and our hopelessness and our inaction and despair is rooted in the whisper of evil that we don't even remember and how we've agreed to it and to set that beaver dam in place. And that beaver dam is another, it's, it's become our, our pair of glasses, it's become our ears. It affects the way we see God and this definition, this vision of God then does what? It confirms our I am not. So you got the whisperer right there with the doctrine of God saying, See, I told you. And then this thing gets to going around like this, and it triangulates, and it goes round and round and round and round and round. And some of us, not all of us, 
But many of us go, uh, have been, or at least go to churches where the first thing that we're told about the gospel is that we're sinners. Well, we already know that. That's not the question. The question is not are we sinners. The question is how in the world can we begin to overcome this? What's the cure? What's the healing of this? How in the world is this going to happen? Now, this is part of this larger discussion because when it comes right down to it, this G.O.D. framework has within it a view of the cross and a view of the Christian life and that God is now satisfied because of Jesus dying on the cross so He now accepts us. And we're going to go to heaven when we die. And we're going to get a robe to cover over all this stuff. And we're going to get to do the Sunday shuffle in heaven. How you doing? Good to see you. Because we, there's no way you're going to be able to look God the Father in the face and receive His love when you got all this stuff going on inside. We can't even look each other in the face. We can't even be honest with each other about what's going on in our lives. We don't want anybody to know about this because if, any, if someone knows about this, then we have irrefutable proof that this is the truth and I got nowhere to go. So this is what's driving um, uh, our self-salvation. It's driving us into denial. You know, we, we create uh, a situation where just everything's fine. What problem? What are you talking about? Pass the mashed potatoes, please. Did you see the rugby game last night? You just keep this thing real shallow. We can't go there. Because even though we're Christians and we know the Bible backwards and forwards, we know we don't have an answer to this. We don't have the power to overcome this. We can't even hear our own accents and see our own sin well enough to be able to know how to go forward. So we go into denial or we medicate. I mean, one form of medication after another, including, hear me, the study of theology. <laughs> this religion is the biggest drug of all. We can go get so busy for God, we don't have to deal with this. And if somebody calls us out, we appeal back to what we've doing and what we said. Rather than being able to look at this. And of course, in medication, you got the obvious things like drug addictions and, and all the addictions in that area. But the big one that I see right across the world is, is uh, the cell phone. I know people that spend all day long on the cell phone. Now, I'm not saying they don't need a cell phone. I have one. It's important. But you can sure spend a lot of time on this thing listening to the chit-chat chit in order to avoid what's going on in here. You with me? Or in my case, in my life, um, and this, this, is a, this is a good place to, to share this image, this story with you, because I don't want to be hopeless. In my journey, I can see how I got waylaid when I was a little boy. I've gone back and revisited this. I saw it. I'm not smart enough. I'm not there yet. I'm not good enough. And it drove me. And when you look at my life and you interpret my life from that vantage point, you can say Baxter set the goal of becoming something special or getting there by pursuing theology and pursuing this degree. And when he got the degree, it didn't answer this and he didn't know what to do. Because he wasn't going to pretend that he had the answer and do the reverend thing. You know? I'm not doing that. I mean, I'm, I'm not perfect by any stretch of imagination, but I'm not going to stand up and do the, you know, I just, ugh. <laughs> you know, this whole performance thing, I just, it's like, to me, that's like jumping into a tub of cockroaches. You have cockroaches? <laughs> <laughs> I mean, it's like, oh. It's not real, and at least let's not pretend that, that, that it is real. And let's, let's, so in my life, it, it drove me. And at the same time, I look back now at 55, and I see something that is absolutely beautiful. Because what the Lord did, and what He has done, and is doing for me, and is doing for you, and here's an here's a illustration of it. Let's, let's envision a... A little boy and his father, and the father is a master carpet weaver. He like the best in the world. And his little boy wants to help with him, wants to weave with him. 
And so he says to his little boy, okay, you start on that end and you weave toward me and I weave toward you. And so the little boy, of course, is making mistakes right, left, and center. It's just a, it's just a mess. But the father is so good that he's actually incorporating the mess into the master design. And by the time they get done, he's found a way to incorporate all the disasters and the wrong turns and the wrong colors of the little boy into this masterful carpet. So you, you look back at your life and you see that, yes, been trapped in the I am nots and, and driven. Another illustration of this is, you know, J.B. Phillips, the trans, that beautiful translation in the New Testament. I just love this. J.B. Phillips was obsessive compulsive. You know anybody like that? <laughs> And the Lord said, J.B., if you will work out your issues and get healed, then I can give you a place in my kingdom. <laughs> now he says, hmm, we got a young man here who is obsessive and compulsive, and he's really into grammar and words. Hmm, let's let him obsess on the Greek New Testament. And J.B. Phillips took off, and he, he had his... Uh, he did an exhaustive word study on every Greek word in the entire Greek New Testament. <laughs> and instead of the Father, Son, and Spirit saying, look, when you finally get this worked out and you can present something to the distant God that is of value, we'll be proud of. He said, no, I, we can take this. This is this will work. Come on. Be who you are. Be yourself. Watch us weave this thing together. You see, it's, uh, there's this thing that's written into our minds until we are absolutely perfected, we're really of no value. And the whole time the Lord is saying, I've got you. Uh, you're right here in Jesus, in the middle of this. We've got the mess. We've not just become human. We've entered into flesh. And in fact, we've got you in all of your darkness and sin. And when you see the Lord at work in your life, take your own disasters and turn those, as Paul talked about the icon of the cross, and turn your own disasters, even your own willful, rebellious disasters, into something good that is a blessing, then you understand. You know? So either, either the Lord is going to deal with this mess, or he's just going to tell us, look, I gave you the Word of God. Go memorize it and apply it to your life. You know, this is, what's, this is what we, we all know this is there. And we all know that our religion is not working. I mean, I'm not making an accusation. I'm not condemning anybody. I'm saying this is just, either Jesus can get in here and deal with this, or it's a load of rubbish. Because this is where we live, and this is what's going on, and every one of us has a story to tell about how this has worked. And then every one of us is beginning at least to detect that he is at work in my life in ways that are so precious. So I look at my life and I think, you know, here's a, here's a middle son whose father was abandoned when he was two years old, so his father was never really able to be there for him in any kind of personal way of affirmation. He tried, but he couldn't do it. So there are things that this middle son's not getting. On top of that, he's a middle son. And on top of that, his grandmama thinks, bless his heart, he's just dumb. But he's creative. And he's got a really good mind. And so what we're going to do is we're going to plop him down in this little bitty country town on the, on the backside of the backside of Mississippi. There he'll have to rub shoulders with everybody. He'll have to learn how to communicate with everybody in the room because it's not big enough to have your own little private ghettos where it's just us. There he goes to work with Willie Lewis Drones and, and Woody Blackman. There he learns how to communicate. And then what we're going to do is we're going to raise a bunch of questions inside of him and let's wind him up and let him go. <laughs> and then we're going to plop him down with the Torrance Brothers in Scotland and let him obsess his heart to death on the Trinity. <laughs> And then we're going to bring him back and put him in a crisis. We're going to put him in a crisis where it is, uh-oh, this either flies or this is a load of rubbish. What are you going to do? This is not theology. This is life and death. I'm, I'm spiraling down. This has strangled me and strangled my soul, and I'm going down in flames. And then it's like, all of this, I'm looking back now and see it. It was not pretty. <laughs> You know, I wish I could say that I, you know, I prayed the prayer when I was 12 and I won the victory and everything's been wonderful. 
It's just like, it's this a fight. And the Lord is not watching from a distance. He's in it. He's in it with us. And He's weaving something magnificent through this thing. That is just beyond all that we can think or even ask. And we are what He's weaving. It's not even something that He's weaving us for that we can do something for somebody else. It's us. We're the carpet. We're the, the little boy on the other end, but the carpet is us. It's our lives. It's us as persons. That's what He's weaving. That's what He's making. So the answer in this is right here. It's why we keep talking about this. Because this is not the truth about God. The truth about God, and we need about three more boards and I can and, um, but the truth about God is that God is Father, Son, and Spirit. But we don't know that. So how is the Father, Son, and Spirit going to deal with this? How does the Father, Son, and Spirit deal with this? Not by external conversation from a distance. Not by sending us a word of prophecy or a word of direction that we can then study and figure out how to apply. The Lord, the Father, Son, and Spirit is saying, we are going in. And we are going to the bottom of the mess. We're not going to go here. We're not going to go here. We're going right here. Right down to the bottom of the I am nots. And we're going to pitch our tent right there. Jesus, the Father says, Jesus, you go there, and I got your back, and I'm sending the Holy Spirit, and we're going to pitch our tent inside the inside, inside the shack, inside the soul. And instead of I am not, Jesus is going to make his way here, and he does this. I said this is part of the answer to your question. He gets there by submitting to us. When he allows us to beat him to death, he is entering into our darkness. He is stepping right inside everything that's wrong. He's allowing us to take our depression and our hopelessness and our despair and funnel it on him. And he says, bring it, take it. And he's nailed to the cross. And it's the same. He's entering right down to the, in the, to the deepest part of our despair and our darkness. That's why we can discover him there. And I can tell you, if you cannot discover Jesus inside that mess, it is hopeless. We got nowhere to go. We got some dude that's going to write some new prescription that's guaranteed to take away hopelessness, and it'll work for about three weeks because we believe it's something that doesn't work. The only thing in the universe that can work is if Jesus has found a way to get inside of all of this mess. Inside of you, inside of me, inside of the other side of the beaver dam, the big one and the little one, and inside of the darkness of the whole human race. Pitch his tent there and he brought his Father and the Holy Spirit with him. This is not about separation. This is about the Father, Son, and Spirit coming together. Now we can take this whole model and work out a view of Jesus' death on the cross on it and a view of the Christian life on it. You see, with, you follow me? I mean, this is the origin of this. This is why it makes sense to us here with G-O-D and the face this name is God and God we sin and someone's got to pay and Jesus comes and pays and okay Jesus paid he paid it all I'm forgiven that's as far as it can take you it's beautiful to be forgiven but if that's all Jesus did we're going to go to heaven as forgiven sinners with a whole lot of mess inside and a whole lot of inability to even face one another let alone actually live in the freedom of this relationship so Jesus Father, Son, and Spirit said nope I'm going in there and he finds his way there we've misinterpreted it and now is the point in history where we're getting to be a part of the recovery of this vision and as Jesus begins to reveal himself and uh, have a look at Galatians chapter 1 the Saul of Tars Paul because I always thought that Paul's conversion on the Damascus Road was that he saw a light from sky a light in the heavens that dawned on him from the outside and he fell to the ground but when he narrates when he narrates his um, experience in Galatians, he doesn't interpret it that way. He says, 
the Lord set me apart from my mother's womb, which in itself is a shocking statement. Because from his mother's womb to the day on the Damascus Road, Saul of Tarsus was not a good man. I mean, he thought he was a good man. But he ended up being part, at least, in, involved in the murder of Stephen and who knows what else. He was dragging Christians out. We don't know what all was going on. But he himself calls himself the chief of sinners. But it's beautiful. He was set apart from his mother's womb. I got you, Saul of Tarsus. And watch what I do with the mess you've made. Watch me weave this carpet. I've got you, chief of sinners, right here with me. And so it says, When God who set me apart from my mother's womb was pleased to reveal his son, who knows what it says? In me. Before, but you're the, that's the next part. He was pleased to reveal his son, not to me, not external, not Jesus over there. Where's the revelation happen? He says, in me. And even the new, the not included version translates it as in. And in fact, and Paul brought this up the other day. We were looking at this in Francois' uh, The Mirror, Trans Mirror Bible. Francois brings out the fact that the next thing he says um, is that, and he set me apart to proclaim uh, Christ in the nations. Sort of like in Colossians. That he had called me, Paul says, he called me. On, I'm on a divine commission. I have been called to proclaim the mystery that has been hidden from past generations and the ages, but is now being manifested. And what is the mystery? The mystery is Christ in you, the hope of glory. Now you see, what has the evil one done to us? Well, you know, Baxter, you can't just go telling people that Jesus is in them. I mean, what? I guess we're afraid that people may hope that he's there and be disappointed. You know, or somebody's going to believe that Jesus is inside of them and expect to be with, with him in heaven and be disappointed when Peter says, Oh no, Jesus never was in you. This is, this is what we have been given as the Christian community. We have been given the answer to the beaver dam. We have been given the answer to the lethal root. And it's, it's not external. It's Jesus in us. And we are to go tell the entire world. I don't care what religion they are. They could even be Christian fundamentalists. We're to go tell the entire world that Jesus Christ is bigger than they thought he was and that he's come into the midst of their mess and he has pitched his tent inside of their own soul with all of its sin and all of its brokenness and all of its damage. And go ask him, Jesus, are you there? Can you meet me there? Can you reveal yourself to me there? Are we really afraid that if we go tell someone over here who uh, is a Muslim, ask Jesus if he's inside? Are we really afraid he's not there or that he won't show up? And what if he does? What if he shows up? This is where the gospel gets very, very powerful. And it ceases to be preaching and it becomes kerygma. It becomes kerygma. Now the difference is preaching is, is when you're proclaiming the gospel. Kerygma is when Jesus shows up and preaches it in you. And the tuning fork goes off. And the question on the table is, is Jesus Christ really in us or not? I'm saying He is. I'm saying He's way bigger than we thought He was. I'm saying He is the Savior and this is our hope of glory. When we meet Him inside our own insides, inside our own brokenness, inside our own darkness, the evil one has set us up because the last thing we can believe as Christians is that Jesus is inside everybody but our group. The evil one has set us up right here on the very most powerful thing that we have. We cannot conceive of what Paul is saying in Ephesians and Colossians. Christ in you, the hope of glory. Go tell the world. Go tell everybody. They can hope that Jesus is in them. Go tell everybody to look inside and ask, Jesus, are you in there? How cool would that be? Go tell everybody that Jesus is inside the shack. Already got covered with sawdust because he's preparing the coffin for our great sadness or our lethal rue and all of its relational wreckage and damage 
I think that's exactly what the Holy Spirit's saying to us right now, January 2014. And I think it's messing with our brains. And I think we're going, man, he has lost his mind. Or no, he hasn't. Or ask Jesus. Ask him. I tell you, if you think you're going to get Jesus inside somebody, I mean, do you really think that we're that powerful? That we're going to take this person who doesn't have Jesus inside and we're going to get them to do something and go boom and Jesus is going to be inside then? Are we that powerful? Do we really believe Jesus is absent? Do we really believe that Billy Bob Brewer from Arm, Mississippi over here got here apart from Jesus Christ? And we approach him. He's never been to church. I know him. He doesn't want anything to do with church. Do we really believe that he's a living, breathing person on planet Earth and he got here apart from the Father, Son, and Spirit and he exists in separation from Jesus? You know what exists in separation from Jesus? Nothing. Poof. If Jesus withdraws himself from you and from the human race, you can count on it. Woo. Evaporation. Gone. He has made his way inside of our darkness and the evil one has us so knotted up. We so believe in Lord of I am not that we cannot conceive of it. All right, Jesus, you got me in a big crisis now. He has us right where he wants us. We have to resolve this, not theologically. We can get into a big old long theological argument and I like those. And we can get in a big old long contest as who can quote the most Bible verses. Saul of Tarsus was not a good man. And he, when the time was right, God the Father revealed his son, Jesus, in inside. The inside of Saul of Tarsus. And you know what happened? It blew his mind. Dude, he had to go move out for three years to let this thing settle down. Three years it took him to go through them. Because <laughs> it can't be, it can't be, it can't be, it can't be, it can't be. Here's the reasons. Here's the Bible verses. Here's all this. He says, no, it is. Saul, you're wrong. Trust me. Walk with me. I not only know who you are, I know who the Father is, and I know who the Holy Spirit is, and I know what's really going on in your life. And not only that, but I'm going to take all this pharisaical study and all this scholarship and all this work that you poured into this and all of that, I'm going to weave that right into making you the greatest apostle. And I'm going to use you to change the whole world. The question is... Is Jesus Christ who he says he is? Is he inside of us? Has he included us? That's where you turn tonight. You ask him. And when we meet him there, we are getting attached to a person who is in the Father, face to face with him, and in the power and the anointing of the Holy Spirit. I think we're just sort of cranking the Harley here. I mean, I really, I don't think we've seen what's coming. The early church had it. But when that anointing that we have in Jesus Christ is set free because we break these agreements and we start saying, no, I am smart. And you know why I'm smart? I'll tell you why I'm smart. Because I have the mind of Christ. Now, either I can agree with Jesus or I can, I can still believe bless his heart. He's just dumb. We are pretty. We are useful. We are worthy. We are lovable because he is in us. And his life and his love and his beauty is at work within us and it's radiating out of us, little by little in all of its brokenness. I find this to be too beautiful for words. No. <laughs> Simplify it. Do we need to mention the name of Jesus to help people know? Come from a Christian Jesus perspective, or can we simply participate with Father, Son, and Spirit in a real way? Do we have to, to 
use the name of Jesus when we're talking to people to go, can we participate in other ways? Um, the only answer to that question is whatever the Holy Spirit's telling you to do right then and there. Because I've got a friend that, um, I was telling someone earlier about this, he's a beautiful musician, and when he plays music, everybody in the room rocks. And they light their cigarette lighters, and they pay him money. And he thinks he's walked away from Jesus because he grew up in a church where his dad was the pastor and they didn't particularly have a great relationship and he just there was no place for him in his music in that particular form of Christian you know church and so he had to leave to go be a musician and he thinks he's walked away from Jesus and I'm like man you're running right at him but if I bring up Jesus to him then he shuts down so I just talked to him about harmony what is the origin of his harmony? And I said, man, I can see this coming out of you. And so, so you, the Holy Spirit will lead you. Some people are ready to talk about Jesus. Some people are not. Sometimes you don't need to talk at all. Sometimes you do. There's no formulas for that. Now, sometimes you will be asked to give a series of lectures on this. Sometimes you will be given children and grandchildren that you can be with for a long, long time rather than just one lecture. Or one meet, meeting in the... Um. So my challenge in this is that this is the problem. This is my problem. And the solution that I am finding in my life is the revelation of Jesus to me right here. And as I meet him in my darkness, that gives me the authority to break these agreements. I now have something inside of me that I can... I can encounter and I can know that can shout back. Because you know what this is right here? The presence of Jesus in us is this. It's I am. It's his I am. And he's saying his I am. Abba Father. Jesus, I hear your Abba Father inside my own soul. That gives us the power and the authority to begin and the, and the courage to begin to face some of these things and to begin to say no to them. And that's, the, that's like cutting away at the kudzu. Anybody want to make a comment or a question? The God of all is good and supremely noble by nature. Therefore, he's a lover of the human race. Brudale? Oh, yeah, I've heard of him. Really? Did somebody have a comment? Um, so basically, at this point, somebody's at bottom, they broke, and so they turn to what they can turn to, which is Jesus, or God, God, or God. Yeah, you're free to go. I mean, I've been in situations where I, I was told by the Spirit, don't mention Jesus, just ask them, did they see the light? So, and then what you've said is that Jesus is, I am, so that's a thing. I start to see it as light and value and really the opportunity for life. It is. Repeat. First, she was asking about, um, is it necessary to use the name of Jesus in that, or what we tell people to turn to? Um, and I said that uh, there have been times in my life, a couple of times, when I was with people, and um, the first time it happened, I was with a, a man who, um, I didn't know how to handle it. And I asked a friend of mine who was there and knew a little bit more about this. And so the, the question was, do you see the light? You know, do you see the light and move toward the light? And then eventually, as depends on how, you know, the conversation, but eventually we know who the light is. But right now there's so much damage and hurt and some of it inflicted by religion that, that you know, you just don't want to impose some of these structures. So that was the first part of your question. And then the second part was that the I am of Jesus, and it's not a, it's not, there's, when Paul says in Galatians that the Holy Spirit bears witness with our spirit, you know, he's talking about, and we hear Abba Father. What that is, and it doesn't have to be that phrase, but what, what's going on is that we're beginning to hear Jesus' relationship with his Father, and we're seeing 
a, a different God. We're seeing a different, we're beginning to think, Ooh, this may not be what I always thought it was. And so in the end, the Christian life is really about living from Jesus' attachment and from his relation to the Father. And it, it, he, is, he is sharing his sonship with us. And that's a process. So when you're dealing with people that don't have any background in this or you don't have a lot of theological framework, you know, you can, you're free to approach it in a lot of ways. You just ask the Holy Spirit because the Holy Spirit has a relationship with the person and Jesus has a relationship with the person. Now the question really is where are they in processing that? So I don't, um, I remember um, I hurt my back when uh, several years ago and uh, my daughter Catherine was, was two and I found myself on the floor for two or three weeks just just recouping and she and I bonded at that time because that was her world you know and I remember one day thinking you know you don't need to look over at her and speak Hebrew and demand that she learn it before you relate to her you know baby talk get on the floor baby talk so you we're free to meet people in whatever crippled form that they're in in this and to love them and accept them and the doors will open the Holy Spirit will open doors for us to be able to speak but this is this is the framework for me of what's happening that Jesus has made his way here and he's trying to he's trying to give them eyes to see and ears to hear internally and that's what we're looking for we're looking for that we're looking for Jesus inside the other person and we're asking whatever I do don't let me do anything that's going to mess up the conversation that you already have going on I want to participate in this and I don't know enough to know how to do that with the folks in the front row let alone the world but so I'm going to listen, you know, and it's going to be a different conversation with everybody in the room. And it'll be beautiful. And it'll be painful. All at the same time. She had mentioned something about the I am as being an attack against the lies. Yes, yes, I'm sorry. Thank you, Paul. Um, this to me is when I am not worthy Jesus doesn't feel unworthy. We do, because we're, and ultimately the one who feels unworthy is Ophis. Not even us. But he shares his feeling of unworthiness with us in such a way we think it's ours and we believe it. And so Jesus is sharing his sense of worth with us here. And we can begin to identify that. There's no way that we have been completely neglected here by Jesus. There are plenty of things in your life where he has spoken internally. What are you grinning at, Mark? Isn't that good? <laughs> Sounds like Otis, you know. It's like, you know. Um, there are plenty of places, um, and we can begin to see these in people's lives when we speak affirmation to them. Plenty of places where it's been spoken. And you can, you know, build on those in terms of really helping people. Sometimes uh, there are no words and the best thing in the world is just to hold them. You know, sometimes uh, there are people that need a two before upside the head, but most of us need a 30-year hug. Most of us are so beaten down by this, we need a long, long hug and just to sob and to weep in love's embrace. That's what most of us need. And it's hard for us to believe that it possibly could be true. You're telling me that Jesus is already inside of me? He's in, he was already inside the biggest religious prick in all the history. <laughs> That's beautiful. <laughs> this is, um, <laughs> Jesus bringing us home. Yes. We are in him. And we're included in all of his I am's. And that is working to be manifested fully in us by the removal of darkness. And that's the, the dream is not only that we would be included. The dream is that we would be made right. And not just in a fictitious sort of legal standing way. But actually no darkness in us at all. And he's doing it. Yes, we can rest. It's the only way you'll ever rest is when you meet Jesus there. It just, it just like, ooh, this, ooh, I can rest now.
because sometimes I feel myself like my own struggles, but I feel it going on for me, but I do not know whether it's, it's that God speaking with me or is it my own, like, uh, like the devil or the devil doesn't use it, like, we see something that we is it something that we actively participate in or we just sit still? Yeah. There's no formula. We, we want to do that. I mean, I want to do that. I mean, I could, I could write a great book on the 10 steps to I am. You know, I mean, it's just uh, there's no formula because some of us really do need to be still for 10 years and do nothing but let the Lord love on us. And some of us need to pray. Some of us need to say, you know, Paul had to go away for three years to somewhere out there in the Arabian desert. And I don't think he was doing nothing. I think he was trying to pick up bits and pieces of his brain and put them back in there. You know, it's like, I mean, you're talking about getting a, a, a fried brain. So it's, there's no formula there. You know, Jesus, um, the question that I think that he asked us when we begin to be healthy here and we begin to, his love begins to be real to us. Is it in John's gospel, the very first words of Jesus, the very first things in, out of his mouth in John's gospel are a question. It's a question. And he says, the disciple, two disciples of John the Baptist, John the Baptist says, there he is, the Lamb of God. They turn and follow Jesus. And Jesus turns around and he looks at them. And what does he say? He says, what do you want? And I imagine, and it's really funny if you read the text, because their answer is, where are you staying, Jesus? At least the translation of that, but actually they're asking, where do you dwell? Can you imagine Jesus is like, oh, you want to know where I dwell? And his answer is not a formula. And it's not, you know, here's how, to, he just says, come and you will see. I will show you. Follow me. Now, what that looks like in your life is not going to be like mine. And I dare not lay down, but we do it together. You know, we do it as a community. But we're following Jesus. We're saying, Jesus, all right, we want to follow you, and you've got to help me because I'm not good enough to see you. And we talk to one another because you can guarantee that the evil one is scared to death of what's going on in this room right now. <laughs> Because he's being exposed and you're beginning to learn how you can say no to him and defeat him and walk in freedom. He doesn't want this. So what's going to happen is you're going to get hammered again right here with some button where you can just go right back over into the beaver dam and right back into the I am nots and this lethal root. So be aware of that tonight. In fact, we ask you, Holy Spirit, tonight that you would, you would set a, a guard about everyone here in this place that tonight no word... No influence would be allowed in this entire area except the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. All forms of evil are bound in the name of Jesus and by His authority. So that we can rest and, and be loved on a little bit. As we rest in Him, is it necessary to believe? As we rest in Him, is it necessary to believe? Well, Jesus is going to make a believer out of you. But not a believer in the I am nots, but a believer in the I am. But I, there's no formula there again. I mean, I don't know what it would mean for me to insist upon my musician friend to say, you must believe. I don't, I mean, what I know is I want to celebrate the harmony of the Father, Son, and Spirit that is pouring out of that man along with everyone else. And in our relationship, I'm going to be able to say, that's the real Jesus in the right, in the right time. Or it may be somebody else gets to say that, but that's where Jesus will leave him. I mean, will lead him. He's not, Jesus is not ego, egotistical. He's not sitting around saying, no, we're not moving until I get to glory. You know, I mean, look at what he's done. Look at where he's come. Look at what, what he's done. He's humiliated himself in front of the entire cosmos in order to find us in our darkness. He's not sitting around thinking, you've got to glorify me, you've got to glorify me. He wants you free. And he knows the only way you can be free is when you come to know him. And that's a process. It involves very different things in, in everybody's lives. You see that? That's important. It's important if you've got more than one child. <laughs> There's a way different dynamic of relating here. Um, yeah, that's a, Mac. It seems to be important that when we 
become aware that I am useful, I am all these good things I am important to that it's in Jesus that makes us the I am. Yes. We always recognize that because pride can suddenly come in saying I am, you know, all these things. And Satan so would love to get us That's to exactly right. Rather than to always be realizing that it's Jesus that makes us the I am. This this is a beaut thank you. Because it you try pumping yourself up on I am and walk out into this battle. Now, you cannot do it until you hear Jesus. Now, it doesn't necessarily have to be in some people's journey. We're talking about some real brokenness here and religious damage. But when we're talking about what, what we're talking about here in this room with us is you can't even say I am in any way that your soul is even going to listen to unless it's Jesus telling you. Then it's got your attention. And then you're standing in his authority and in his I amness. And that's different. You take on the evil one in your own strength. Like, yeah, I got it now. <clears throat> you be gone. Just leave. See you later. And he looks at, no. We, we stand in Jesus and we participate in his authority and in his name and his I am. That's what the enemy fears. And that's what we stand in. It'll never work. You go try to walk on water like... Paul says in the shack, go at it. Go at it. And you can even say, in Jesus' name, I'm going to walk on water. It's like if he tells you, if you're doing it in him and with him, it works. Otherwise, we're just sort of, and that's what we've got to learn how to do is learn how to participate on the one side without diminishment of the authenticity of our personhood. On the other side, never as if we've got a Harry Potter wand now that's labeled I am and we can fire those things at whatever we want to in our own strength. Or we can call down these things to happen because we just kind of dreamed it up. We can't pump up faith and make something happen. It's, a, it's relationship with Jesus. And it's rooted. It's rooted in his coming down to meet us where we are. And in the very things that make us ashamed. And then we get to see him take all of this and weave that into something beautiful that's shouting his I am whether we know it or not. <laughs> it's just, that's beautiful. Other comments in the back? <clears throat> what about Satan? What happens to him? I know what happens to him if Paul Lavelle gets a hold of him, who's one of my friends that just doesn't like the way he just destroys children. Uh, so I think what's going to happen is Jesus is going to grow all of us up over a period of time where we can discern good from evil 50 miles away, and we don't want anything of it. And I think we drive him right out of the good creation of God. And we do it in Jesus, participating with him. Now, right now, I'm like, I'm not even sure I can detect him. I'm like struggling to understand. Sometimes it sounds like Jesus, and sometimes it sounds like, and I'm like, it, we're having to learn how to do this. It's just not, you know, we're not, we're not computers with Jesus software. We're learning how to hear his voice. We're learning how to, to discern good from evil, life from death, right from wrong. And how many times, I mean, think about this. How many times has the Christian church reached for something that looked like life in Christ, but in fact it was religion? Well, we're learning that that's not it. You know, it takes time. But eventually, to me, Jesus is going to bring us up to speed to where we are alert and, and fully aware of the evil one's schemes. We smell his breath at 100 miles and tell him to be gone. And he's got no place to get in. We're the one that lets him in. There was one other comment. Bye. Just on that, the discussion we were having this afternoon, um, how did he get into the creation? The whole creation of this Jesus, and he was in the creation. Where did that, you know, where did it say? Dude, I know no one has that answer. It is a mystery beyond us. We don't know how could someone who, how it, does, it doesn't make sense to us that Adam and Eve could be created as, in a beautiful place, as beautiful as they were and right, 
and yet they fell. It certainly doesn't make any sense that there was one, an angel who was beholding the face of the Father, Son, and Spirit, and they fell. That, that's just like, if somebody tells you they got that one figured out, hit the door. I can assure you they don't. We don't know. We don't know the answer to that. But we know that he gets involved in us because we give him permission. We agree with him. He doesn't, we don't belong to evil. The creation is good. We don't belong to evil. He gets in by lying to us and we agree to him and that's the way he gets involved in our life and in our memories and in our, and in our lives. And so Jesus is bringing us up to speed to be warriors. This is a battle. He's given us the sword of the Spirit, which is, a, is the rhema of God. He's given us the gospel, the hell and the salvation, the feet, the armor. He's saying we're going to learn to stand up and fight that back. And maybe somewhere down the road we'll figure out how all that happened. But at some point we're going to resist him and, and be so good at it that he's going to be, Jesus is going to bring us to be as good at dealing with evil as he is. Now he's got a lot of work to do, it seems like to me. <laughs> Um, but I can at least now know this is the way he works, at least a lot of times. So, what other comment? I don't know if this is a question for the state people or not, but it's just making me wonder now what, what do we do about church? Like, like, it's not like it's a church. Paul? <laughs> 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 I tell you what we do about the church. It's like Paul said, it's, sometimes the Lord calls us to be in the middle of it and we're free to do so. I'm talking about the institution. Because as far as I'm concerned, this right here is the church. Um, but as far as the institution and being involved, and sometimes he tells us, you know, I don't, I don't want you near there right now. And that's good too. But as, as far as people are concerned, we meet them in their passion. We know who they are. We meet them in their disasters. And we're free to love them and accept them. And part of that, I think, I'm, I'm not making this as a prophetic statement, but I have a hunch, I have a hunch that many of us who have been wounded by religion are being healed, and part of that healing is that the Lord classically uses us to turn around and help those in it. Uh, and so I, the church is the body of Christ, the bride of Christ. It is beautiful. It's in process. Uh, so it's the, you know, the difficulty is with institutionalism, not with people and local congregations. Um, and so it's just keep it on the, the thing of people. And the only people there are are people in Jesus and they're blind as bats, like me. And we're learning how to walk in Jesus together. And we know that we stick right here. And if we don't stick right here, we're going to get it handed to us again. So we come here, and so the whole purpose to me of the community of faith and churches is that I get to come back to you Sunday or whenever we meet, and you can hold my hand again and say, Baxter, you know, look here, this is what happened. Here's who you are. This is what's going on. And, the, and you can be brought back into the conversation again. Now, whether you have a cross on top of a building and you meet there, I don't know, but that fellowship is essential. Because we cannot fight this on our own. And so, um, yes, there are all over the world. It's beautiful. Yes. Now, Paul and I have the beautiful opportunity to be with a lot of those pastors. And we're going to be with pastors on, I don't know what day it is, uh, next week sometime here in New Zealand. Uh, Monday? Monday? Um, yeah, it's happening all over. And it's easy. It's, it, the thing is, it, I just keep, when, it, when I've got my A game, I, I, I take my church glasses off. I'm just looking at people. You know, it's just people. It's people in Jesus, and we're blind. Some of us are way, way out there, and others are a little bit closer. And some of us, you know, it's just people, and you meet them right where they are, and we move forward together. And... Yes. <laughs> yes. 
Yeah, and it's a journey where people, and this isn't important because you, you people in this room uh, are maturing in the faith. And so when one of those pastors who's really wrestling and going forward gets waylaid, instead of just casting him off, we know what went on. We know, so we, we're the ones that can go in and say, hey, let's walk together. And you rekindled. I and mean, so it's just terrible how we treat each other sometimes. You know? uh, but we know this is the war. And this is what happens. And we also know that religion in itself is just another form of, of trying to save ourselves. And it's not going to work. So you know it's a matter of time for us that are caught in that before the wheels come off. And we're the people that could say, well, we knew the wheels were going to come off. And it's okay. We're bound. To, we're going to walk this together. That's beautiful to me. That, that's something that's not happening, especially in, rarely, it seems to me, in the North American context. <laughs> you know, you get... Um, Anyway, thank you for that comment. I, I, I have given my entire life to the church, to the body of Christ, the communion of believers. I've given my entire life. And yet right this moment, I don't have a church home. <laughs> I don't. Not, not in my hometown, anyway. Time to quit? Oh, is it that late? Man, I pulled a Paul Young, huh? We're not leaving G.O.D. on the board, don't worry. <laughs>